Thank you for watching this short video on how to lead intercessions in church. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to lead um, intercessions prayers on a usual Sunday service and then Ro is going to talk a little bit about how to lead prayers for all age services. And our hope is that when you've watched this video you may be encouraged to perhaps be brave and put yourself forward to be able to do uh, prayers and intercessions on a Sunday service because this isn't something that should be restricted just to clergy and readers it's a valuable ministry uh, that would be great if we could all be part of. You might think to yourself well why do we have intercessions in the middle of a service anyway perhaps you even think that they disrupt the flow we've been singing for a while we've heard God's word and then suddenly there's this period of quite structured um, prayer and intercession. I think there are a number of reasons why it's really important. Firstly, it's about us as the church and the leader praying on behalf of the church uh, for the needs of the world. And when we pray for the needs of the world, we bring God's concerns and his will into the minds of the congregation and then direct them back in the form of prayer. We are cooperating with God um, in his work. It also is important because it moves the focus away of, from the service, away from just ourselves and a danger of being introspective and uh, just being about what we're getting from the service uh, to the wider needs. It reminds us that we are part of a global church with global needs and so our prayers need to be global as well. And also it helps us to recognise that communally and individually we can place both the ordinary and the extraordinary um, concerns into the hands of God. So we can pray for the really big things like global warming, war in Ukraine, um, famine. And we pray for the small things, the concerns that people have over jobs and exams and families and health, the things that afflict all of us from time to time. Both of these we can place into God's hands. Um, there are three Bible passages that um, it's worth considering. One of them is 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. Uh, Paul writes that I urge you to pray for all kings and governors um, for, for their peace and well-being. Uh, there's a command there that we um, bring our leaders into God's presence. Uh, and Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7 um, Jeremiah is talking to the exiles in um, Babylon and he says to them, uh, pray for the welfare of the city because in the city's welfare, so is your welfare. And it's worth remembering that even if perhaps we have strongly disagree with the politics of our country and our politicians, perhaps we disagree with the particular way that our society seems to be going, um, yet we are still commanded to pray for it even if we feel in exile here. Uh, because in the welfare of our community, in the blessing of our community, so we are blessed also. And then 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your anxieties on the Lord, for he cares for you. Big anxieties or small anxieties, all of them we give to the Lord. And there is something comforting about praying as a church to put our concerns into God's loving hands. So what about the structure and the style of the way we might lead intercessions? You will have seen intercessions led a certain way. And perhaps you think, oh, I can't lead it that way. Uh, and it's really important that actually we lead it in a way that we feel comfortable with, not just copying other people. I think as a good practice, it's helpful to divide prayers into bite-sized chunks. It's, it's not a sermon uh, and people can easily lose concentration. Uh, intercessions are a collaborative event even if the only thing that the congregation are doing is saying amen yet it is a joining of prayer together so by having nice bite-sized chunks um, which people can then assent to and affirm that enables us all to pray together my own model is to begin outwards and pray inwards so I begin with the world um, with things that I know are going on in the news whether it's war famine droughts floods um, global warming. Then I move to the church internationally, particularly the persecuted church, but also locally, pray for our bishops. Uh, I then pray for our community, uh, what is going on in our country, um, in our city, before narrowing it down on our own church community, remembering those who are particularly struggling 
with, with health issues or discouragement at this time. So my own model is to begin outwards and come inwards, uh, a fourfold pattern, uh, which can easily be summed up with four petitions and a nice easy, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Don't be afraid of using silence. It's not all about words. It can be really powerful if after praying for something very simply, you just have a pause and allow the congregation to reflect on what you've just said or perhaps add their own petitions as well. If you want to be creative, look at the Bible passage of the day. Is there something that prompts you as a particular structure arising out of that passage? Um, is there something that the preacher has said which you think could work really well um, with your intercessions? So um, by all means be creative, um, but have a helpful pattern that allows you to be able to, to lead prayers without um, uh, too much worrying about how creative you need to be. Now, in terms of style, I think it's worth remembering that lengthy words weary God and congregations are warning that Jesus talks about in, in, in the gospel, um, about the, the scribes and the Pharisees who think they impress people by using lots of long words and long prayers. Um, God isn't impressed by the size of our vocabulary. Use a language that the congregation can understand and that is natural to you. In terms of time, uh, I think five minutes is perfectly adequate. In fact, longer than that, um, and it may seem slightly long. Um, it doesn't have to be long as well, um, even two or three minutes. Um, so don't worry about having to write really long prayers. Um, brevity is a virtue. Remember that the whole congregation um, have to be able to assent to, to what you're praying. Uh, that means they must understand it and, and to some extent be able to agree with it as well. Um, so pray for things that they will know are happening. Um, if you're going to pray for something very obscure, you may have to just explain it very briefly beforehand. Um, and try not to pray for anything divisive or controversial. It might be on your heart, but if there's somebody in the congregation who really disagrees with you on that, um, then it's not going to help them pray. So just be sensitive to that. Um, Congregational actions and involvement are great, but don't make them too complicated. Um, I think writing prayers on pieces of paper, um, lighting candles, um, perhaps having a little bit of a, a, a chance to a taise tune or something. They're, they're all great if you think you can resource that. Um, but don't worry about creativity for the sake of creativity, uh, particularly if it's going to make leading prayers burdensome for you. Um, if at the 11 o'clock service you do wish um, the musicians to be part of the intercessions and then contact them beforehand and get their ideas about what they might want to do. Um, again, singing a, a simple response can be really an effective way of just building in um, praise as part of our prayers. Um, and then just remember that the style of your prayers will depend uh, partly on the nature of the service. So be sensitive um, to what is happening in the service and the service leader should be able to be in touch with you beforehand. Clearly, if it's a baptism service, you're going to pray differently to if it's a Remembrance Day service. Um, so be aware of um, particular nuances that may impact um, different styles of service. If you're stuck for resources, then the parish office has this book, um, uh, David Adams, uh, The Radiance of His Glory. It has prayers for every single Sunday of the year, uh, which are also um, connected to the Bible readings. Um, you can use them straight as they're written or you can adapt them. Um, but it's there in the parish office. Do ask to borrow it if you would like to. Um, also, if you um, go on the Church of England's website and um, Google new patterns of worship, um, then there come up a whole list of prayer resources there as well um, under section F. It's a bit of a faff to find, but uh, once you do find it, um, there's some helpful thoughts there as well. Um, and if you've got any access to anything written by the Iona community or the Northumbria communities, then they're Celtic style um, prayers as well, which some people really enjoy uh, and can be a slightly different way of praying. So there are resources out there as well. You don't have to start from scratch. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. 
And finally, some do's and don'ts. Uh, so do uh, check the news that morning in case something really significant has happened. Um, if there's been a terrible disaster, um, then you don't want to go through um, your prayers without referencing it. Um, read the parish email the week before in case there's specific things coming up that you think would be good to pray for. Uh, use language that is natural to you. You're not the preacher. You're there on behalf of the congregation, not doing things to the congregation. So using language that is natural to you and natural to the people praying with you. And think of places or people that perhaps have just slipped off our radar, particularly when there's something big on like the war in Ukraine. It's, it's very easy to forget about other things happening in, in Burma or Afghanistan or um, sub-Saharan Africa. And if there are things that you're aware of that uh, perhaps we prayed for in the past but aren't praying for recently, uh, just bubble them up again uh, so that we can keep all these needs at the forefront of our minds and give them over to God. And then some don'ts. Um, don't use the intercessions as a notice slot. Um, God doesn't need to be told what's happening. Uh, one of my favourite prayers that I've heard uh, was, uh, Lord, we pray for the coffee morning coming up this Saturday. It's at 10.30 and please try to be on time. Um, I think they're addressing the congregation at that point, but uh, possibly they're addressing God as well. Um, don't make political points. It is really difficult if... Uh, you really struggle with our leaders um, and you have clear views about who should be in government and who shouldn't. Um, God knows your heart, but publicly we need to be more careful. Um, again, um, a prayer I once heard uh, began with, Lord, we pray for Tony Blair. He says he's a Christian, but I'm not sure about it. Um, God knows we don't. But Paul writes to Timothy that we should pray for our leaders. So pray for our leaders to be blessed and to govern us with wisdom, integrity and compassion. Don't spend ages on the prayers. I think a lot of people don't do prayers partly because they're scared of standing up front, but also because they worry that it's going to take a whole afternoon. They, they really shouldn't. Just write the things down that you think need praying for them. Pray them in a style that you feel confident praying it. Um, really don't, don't spend more than an hour maximum um, putting them together. Um, and finally, the final don't is don't pray for people by name unless you are sure that they want to be mentioned publicly. Uh, we can often be aware of particular needs and sufferings within the church. They might be really on our hearts, but if that person hasn't given us permission to make it public, then um, pray silently for them. Um, but don't make it as part of um, the main congregational prayers. So I hope that helps you and I'd be really happy to have a chat with anybody who would like to have a go at leading into sessions. As I said, this is not something that only the clergy or readers should do. It should be something that every member of our congregation feels that they can be equipped and to do, to pray to God um, on our behalf. When we listen to intercessory prayers in church, we may listen very carefully and then we'll say Amen at the end. We agree with what's being said and it helps to hear how other people say things. But I would like to suggest that there is another way to lead in sessions that call for a more active engagement. And I'm just going to comment and give a few ideas on what I mean by that. Now, by intercessions that call for more active engagement, I'm not talking just about what we do for children or what we provide when, for adults when they're present with children. But I think this actually is for anybody, whatever their age, um, whatever their learning preferences, whatever their walk of life is. And as the Book of Common Prayer says, that when we lead into sessions, we are actively and expectantly helping people to, I quote, make their requests known to God. We do so being confident that God hears and he responds. And of course, that's the basis of our leading prayers, that we believe that God hears. And I think it's quite a good idea if we prayed about something a few weeks ago to come back to it and say, well, how did God answer prayer? We expect him to hear and to answer. Now, it's worth noting a whole load of differences about how we 
think, how we talk, how we learn, how we pray. It's worth noting that we engage in conversation in different ways depending on the context, the people that are involved, our personalities, how we're feeling. And we converse with God in the same sort of way. Um, it depends how we feel, it depends what we're talking about. Some of us uh, think before we speak and that affects how we pray, we prepare our prayers. Uh, some of us think as we speak and I'm one of those people. Some of us think after we have spoken, perhaps some of us don't think at all. But the different way in which we talk affects how we pray and how we engage in group intercessions. Some of us like silence, some of us like stillness or music in the background, or some of us like to listen to, to worship songs to help us to pray. Some of us like to write. Some of us like to listen to prepared prayers. Some of us may like, and that's maybe our background, we might like spontaneous or extemporary prayers. Some of us like to be given some space to personally respond. Then, of course, there are the different learning styles that we have, and these impact how we pray. Um, though, of course, we learn to appreciate other learning styles than, than the ones that come naturally to us. There are three basic ones and I'm going to suggest some ideas about how these different learning styles will call for different sorts of activities to help people to respond to God. Basically there are those who learn by visual stimuli that helps them to, to, um, to remember and to understand and to be curious by what they see. For other people um, they learn by listening and for other people they learn by doing which is sometimes called kinesthetic learning. So we need to take into consideration all these different factors, learning styles, um, what we're praying about, um, how we engage in conversation, our backgrounds, uh, and so on. So it's quite an exciting thing to think about how we can lead worship, or lead, lead prayers, intercessory prayers, uh, using our imagination to offer people different opportunities to respond to God. We have to be very humble because basically we're expecting God to use us to help others to pray and to make their requests known. So let me make some suggestions about the sort of things that you might want to do um, if you wanted to use some visual stimuli, you wanted to help people who particularly appreciate what they see as a means of helping them to talk with God. None of this is very original, but I've just, I'll just give you basically a list of some of the things that I have experienced or some of the things that I have done when leading prayer. One of the most obvious things is the use of candles. Um, it could be scented ones, big ones, small ones, uh, different people lighting them at different times. But they remind us that Jesus comes as light of the world, that he is present with us, and the smoke rises upwards, this idea of of incense um, and uh, our prayers rising up to God. Of course, bubbles also rise upwards and I love it when we use bubbles in prayer. There's something a bit random about them and out of control, but of course they do go pop. Uh, I hope that our prayers uh, don't go pop in quite the same way. There are images that we might offer people. This might be large pictures. It might be things that we put on the screen, pictures of people, of places, of objects, of symbols that stimulate prayer. We might want to use different colours, coloured scarves or different colours on the screen. Grey for grief, green for new life, red for danger, the rainbow for hope. We might use objects such as chains for those who are trapped, bucket and spade if praying for people on holidays. Road signs are another interesting thing to use when thinking about how we pray. We might want to use an illustration of a Bible verse to put up on the screen or the words of the Lord's Prayer. We might want to use a flip chart and invite people to, to give topics for, for prayer. We might want to read together a prayer from the screen or from the service book. Then there are auditory prayers, prayers that um, basically we, we are going to listen to, the sounds that, that we hear. Uh, 
uh, it's quite good to have a variety of voices um, to, to lead the prayers. Uh, but of course, we'll need to make sure that the microphone's working properly so that um, everyone can hear. We might want to give people one phrase to respond between each prayer topic. We might want to have background music, and I particularly appreciate in the whole church communion service when we have singing and music and prayers beautifully blended together. We might want a song response, and, and the Teze songs um, are particularly powerful in this respect. Or sound effects, things like a bell or a whistle, running water or body percussion. People bang their chest make all sorts of sounds with their mouth, um, clap their hands, tap their feet. Uh, we might want to allow for silence, for lament, for rest. This might be accompanied by enabling people to be aware of their breathing, of their breathing in deeply, slowly, relaxing. We might want to interview someone who identifies three prayer needs and there may be more than one person can pray for them. And it's good to lead with someone else. Uh, and if, if you're thinking about getting involved in leading intercessions, it's also a good idea to do it with somebody else. It's also important to remember when we're using our voice that our voice can be high or it can be low. We can talk very, very fast or we can talk very slowly. We can speak very loudly or very softly in a whisper, though of course we do need to be heard. Then there are the active prayers, and it is important that we uh, never let these prayers become gimmicky or even competitive with the person who led the prayers last week. We can sprinkle water, cleansing for cleansing, maybe using a, a sprig of rosemary, there are smells, incense, perfume, fresh bread, smelly socks, can anoint with oil, it's especially effective around Ash Wednesday. We can use paint, Play-Doh, pipe cleaners, writing, drawing. We can use the body, five fingers. We can have thumbs up, things to thank God for, thumbs down for confession, thumbs out to pray for others, thumbs in to pray for ourselves. We can stand up and look at the exit to pray for the community. We can look up at the ceiling, at the roof, and pray for the world. We can look across the aisle and pray for others. We can look down on our feet to pray for those who are desperately in need. We can pray with our hands open to receive or fists clenched in fear or anger. We can clap for joy. We can clasp for comfort. Consider how we're sitting. Are we relaxed? Are our feet on the floor? What are we doing with our hands, our shoulders? Are we clenched or unclenched jaw? We might even suggest that people kneel and can turn our heads. Sometimes we've had prayer stations where people have a choice as to where they go, a choice as to how long they stay in one place, a choice for how they pray. If you want to do this, it's really important to the service leader knows that it's going to happen because that will take more time and maybe something else would have to be cut out of the service to make time for that. It's the possibility of a prayer wall, people making their own requests. Um, occasionally we have broken up into small groups. Um, not everyone would be comfortable with this, and especially somebody who's new to the church. Um, they, they may not be comfortable with that, but um, that is something that is worth, worth thinking about. And then there's taste. We could share a biscuit or a sweet from a country of a mission partner or a place that we're particularly praying for. Of course, we have to be aware of allergies and hygiene. I'd just like to suggest that if, if you want to lead into sessions and you want to do something that's a bit different, talk about it with somebody and then just take a risk. It might not make sense to everybody, but it could be the means by a few people really are unable to communicate with God and he with them to be bold and imaginative. I'm very aware that it is a privilege to lead others in prayer, to help people to talk with God, to give them the words or the vocabulary to say and to help them to listen to him. But I think it's a, an opportunity 
that anybody in the church, I would like to encourage you to think, is this something that you could do? It could make all the difference to other people and certainly in preparing to lead into sessions. I think it challenges us and benefits us in our own relationship with God. So I hope that's given you a few ideas and I'm sure that many people will have lots of other things they'd like to suggest too.